Hi, I'm Jen Sherlock, and welcome to my lifestyle podcast, Live Without a Net. The podcast showcases people who live fearlessly and have the ambition to create something. I'll showcase change makers who have decided to let go of their safety net in order to survive. So let's jump right in. Hi, I'm Jen Sherlock. Welcome to Live Without a Net. I have Tony DiGirolamo. He's the founder of DiGirolamo Financial Strategies, and he's a friend. He's also a Jersey Man member, Jersey Man Magazine member, and I see him often. He always has great energy. Welcome to the show, Tony. Oh, thanks, Jen. Thanks for this opportunity. Greatly appreciate it. So uh, before we start, though, if you don't mind, I have to go through all my disclosures because of regulations. So uh, I'm a reg- I'm going to read it so I don't mess it up. Um, I am a registered representative and investment advisor representative of Equity Services, Inc. Securities and investment advisory services are offered solely by Equity Services, Inc. member FINRA, SIPC. Rose Tree Building 2, 1400 North Providence Road, Suite 3007, Media PA, 19063 610 891 9700. My company, DiGiralmo Financial Strategies, is independent of Equity Services, Inc. As a certified financial planner professional, I have to also disclose that the board, Certified Financial Planner Board of Standards Center for Financial Planning, Inc., owns licenses in the certification mark CFP, Certified Financial Planner, in the United States to Certified Financial Planner Board of Standards, which authorizes individuals who successfully complete the organization's initial and ongoing certification requirements to use the certification marks. This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not to be construed as an offer to sell or of the solicitation of an offer to buy a security in any state where such offer or solicitation would be illegal. Any authorized use is prohibited. This podcast was recorded on September 9th, 2024. You can view it at any of my social media or my webpage, DiGiralmo Financial Strategies, and uh, Jen's podcast, uh, uh, Live Without a Net. Takes care of that drama. (laughs) Perfect. So, Tony, how did you decide entrepreneurship was the right fit for you? I'm sorry, say again? How did you decide that entrepreneurship was the right fit for you? You know, um, when we were initially going over some of the questions, that really struck me. And and, uh, because I always have enjoyed helping people. Uh, And eventually, that just led me to financial planning. Uh, I discovered, you know, I can make a constructive uh, change in people's lives. Um, I was out and about. I met somebody in the financial services business, uh, was asked to attend a a meeting. It seemed to be a good fit. And that way it allowed me to become an entrepreneur plus do what I love to do and help people. Yeah. I mean, you have a natural gift where you can just, you know, reach out. You're very comfortable talking to people and, and I see you at events. Is that how you, you know, are getting most of your clients or has it been referral based just because you've been doing it so long? Yes. Word of mouth. That's the best. Word of mouth. That means you're doing something right. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I guess so. Hopefully, hopefully. (laughs) What setbacks have you had over these past, you know, how many years has it been for you? How many decades? I guess we're pushing 30 now, 30 years in the business. I, I pretty much have had the same type of setbacks as I think as most people who start out in business. Uh, capital gets a little strained. Um, uh, you make a lot of mistakes. You, you have people, your, your selling cycle for lack of better description is longer because people don't make a decision quickly. Um, you know, uh, just in general, I think the same mistakes that most people do spend money in the wrong direction for marketing, uh, spend time, you know, uh, in the wrong direction until you start to get a comfort level of who you are and what business you really want to be and realizing you cannot be all things to all people. So it's, it's a maturity. I think if you, you would, you know, would be the best answer. And going back to your podcast questionnaire, you had said you met someone in the financial services industry that inspired you. Yes. And you realized, wow, I can do this and help people at the same time. Can you share that story? Well, uh, 
with my CFP designations, I have been required to have a continuing ed. And um, uh, there was a, an insurance company uh, back in the early 90s who was having continuing ed classes. And uh, I happened to meet somebody in a networking event who was a member of that group. And he said to me, hey, Tony, you need continuing ed? I said, absolutely. He said, well, why don't you come over and, and come out and get your continuing ed here and hear what we're all about? And I went, sure. I had nothing to lose. I get my continuing ed and hear what they have to say. And uh, afterwards, that gentleman who, uh, who I uh, uh, knew uh, introduced me to the, 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 the general manager. And uh, one thing led to another. And, they, you know, they, uh, they got me set up in the business. And were you in finance? finances before that or were you more in insurance i was uh i had been working in commercial banking for many years um i was a commercial lender i ran a commercial lending group um uh, and th that in itself with working with business owners and key employees and such just helped lead me down to the you know financial planning so i think to answer the question most times people think of financial planning or wealth management, if you will, as just managing money. Uh, financial planning is everything put together, both the investment side and the real, uh, certain types of, of insurance programs on, on the other side of the ranch. Um, so prior to getting, so when I got into this business, I got in full with the whole financial planning, insurance and investments. But prior to that, I was doing commercial lending. Oh, interesting. So it's it's in the same field, more or less. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you enjoyed it. Was your college degree in, in something with finance? <laughs> no. no. Oh, really? <laughs> no, it was it was general business, but nothing, nothing like, you know. Listen, when I went to college, financial planning really wasn't truly a, an industry at that time. Wow, I yeah. didn't know that. I didn't realize so, that. Yeah, well, thanks for reminding me of <laughs> that I voted for Lincoln in 1860. But uh, no, it really wasn't uh, as key of an uh, element uh, as it has evolved into. So that's why I was, you know, initially started in, the, if you will, finance. I, I always had a, a good feel for money and finance and things like that. So I ended up going in the financial field via commercial banking. And then as time went on, the financial, I became more familiar and financial planning became more uh, uh, prevalent, if you will. Okay. You know, if you remember the old days, you would meet somebody out networking and somebody was either I sell life insurance or I'm a stockbroker. Yeah. That was it. Okay. And then as time went on, everything merged. And now, now you have, nobody says they're a stockbroker anymore, I guess. But um uh, that's how things evolve. So there wasn't any like financial planning school way back when, uh, when I decided to get into this business, then I found the, uh, the Institute for certified financial planning out of Denver. And that led me to get how I got my training on that. And I do the American college that's also actively involved with, uh, financial planning education. Got it. So, um, you're not just a wealth manager, you help with strategies, do you help with tax planning? So financial planning is kind of broken down into several different components, whereas wealth management, a lot of times is just focused on managing people's money. Uh, financial planning is trying to say, how do we use that money to your best benefit for you and your family? Uh, how to make smart decisions, uh, whether it's investments, whether insurance planning, business succession planning, estate planning, Key, key person benefits, uh, uh, employee benefits. It's uh, There's financial advisors and they're financial planners. And planners kind of take a, um, I know it's kind of an overused term, but holistic, holistic approach more so. So uh, uh, that's basically what I do. You look at retirement planning, all yes. of that. Okay. Yes. That's great. I'm not a math person, if you can notice. <laughs> um, always the creative one. <laughs> That's okay. Somebody's yeah. got 
I, that's what I said. You know, uh, public relations has, been, has done wonders for you. Yes, it definitely fits my personality. So it's meant to be for me. Yes. Um, so how do you stay focused and motivated when, um, I don't know, times get tough or you have an issue with a client? Um, you know, there's always some snafu that happens. So take a deep breath. Uh, try to, to work my, stay on, on focus, stay on my plan, realizing that, you know, what works, what doesn't work. Um, realize if I deviate from a plan, uh, my strategy, it always comes back to not be successful and takes me back to some of the mistakes I made. So I would say because of experience, knowledge, et cetera, uh, I know what works, what doesn't. Uh, I'm not going to try and reinvent the wheel. Uh, one plus one equals two. I don't want to get into, you know, any any detail on that. If a, if a, a client is, is upset or something like that, we have a conversation. Um, I make a point of hearing them. Empathy is a big, big uh, consideration. And I, I just try to hear what's really motivating their concern, their pain or whatever it may be. And then, and then work to a satisfactory uh, conclusion for them. Uh, you know, I realize uh, I work for them. And uh, what I have to do to, you know, put out the fire and we, we deal with those issues if we can deal with them. What skills do you think you need the most in your business? You said empathy is one. Well, I think empathy and, and uh, listening are the two biggest ones. You can have all the knowledge in the world. I know a lot of people that are very knowledgeable in this industry and yet they'll turn people off because they just try to sell, sell, sell. They, they, they're talking most of the time. They're not listening. Um, and, uh, you know, this is people's lives. This isn't like, okay, well, you bought a lousy dinner at a place. I'm not going to go back and it doesn't kill your world. I mean, these are things that affect, you know, the client, the client's family, the client's employees, uh, generations to come. So if you don't hear what they're trying to accomplish and understand what their, what their needs are, uh, I think you can be the most knowledgeable person in this world. You're not, you know, if if somebody's telling me that they're allergic to chocolate and I'm trying to sell you chocolate, I'm not listening to you. Okay. okay? And and that to me are the two biggest things, listening and empathy. Yeah, they're definitely two important ones that in order to help someone, you need to listen. Yeah. Hear what they have to say. Yeah, we're in the business to help people, trying to improve what they're doing, put them in a better position. What's the biggest risk you've taken as an entrepreneur? Well, I think the biggest risk I took was not having the capital I should have had to start. However, um, that also became a great motivator. But I thought if, in retrospect, if I had waited until I actually had enough capital to not have to sweat the small stuff, I probably never would have jumped. So uh, I think the biggest risk was uh, going out there, knowing I didn't have enough capital to sustain me for a period of time and figured I, you know, I, I can't fail. I can be of value for people. I just have to figure out the best way to communicate that and show them. Sure, that's the best way, you know, the podcast is named live without a net. So it's kind of like sink or swim. You don't have a choice. You don't have a choice. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't either. Yeah. So I started the same as you. Yes. Computer. <laughs> Not going wood, right? Right. Exactly. <laughs> I would hear. Um, but um, so there's not much you would change. Is there any, anything you see in your future that maybe maybe the financial landscape is changing uh, there's a big election coming up like is there anything you're preparing yourself for in your industry that i or others may not be aware about so um the first part of your question is i have a concern about my my industry in general i 
I see there's more and more gravitation to artificial intelligence. There's uh, more and more direction into commoditizing products, if you will. There's a lack of value and more towards cost. And I think, and people uh, haven't really gone through a long-term market correction. I mean, we've had the market down several hundred points and then within two, three days, it's back up and everybody shrugs it off. Uh, you know, I think the last time was 2008, 2009, you know, taking a pandemic issue out of play because that was like an anomaly. But as far as the market, I mean, that took about 20 some months, give or take, for it to start coming back. And people haven't, I mean, that's 16 years ago. So there's a lot of people in the market that are 30, 40, even 50 who weren't even in the market back then. And, uh, you know, my concern, I can't control the elections. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what the Fed's going to do. I don't try to tell people what it is. Here's my simple, simple logic with my clients. What are you trying to accomplish? What kind of risk are you willing to accept? And then have a conversation about that. Well, they'll say, well, the market comes back and I'll say, well, if it had a 20% market correction, how would you? And they're like, well, I'm not comfortable with that. Well, let's not chase the rainbow. You know, the guy at work says he's got 30% return on his money last year. I said, okay, good. But if yeah. I try to get you chasing that rainbow, you're also ch chasing potential loss exposure that's not beneficial for you. So let's design a strategy that fits your needs. You can sleep at night and knock on wood. That's one of the benefits I have that even when the market goes crazy, my phone doesn't ring off the hook. I'm actually proactive. I reach out to them, see if they have any concerns or not. But no, they're like, Tony, we had these conversations. You told me if things go you know, sideways, what could happen, how we're protected in those events. And those conversations are... are their minds are at ease. Yeah, just curious. Do they ever ask you about inflation? I mean, obviously everything's gone up. I saw eggs that I used to buy went up to $9 a couple of weeks ago. I was in shock. Do they ever ask you those type of questions or do they only stick to their Well, that's and part of the, the process, if you will, because like you said, uh, what it cost you, you know, 10 years ago for something and 10 years from now is going to be more expensive. So you know, we try to have that conversation to say, look, not only is your purchasing power today X, but for us to keep pace with inflation, our purchasing power has to grow exponentially. And how do we do that? So we design programs that within possibilities, try to keep as much pace with inflation as possible and then recognize that you know, there are other assets may have to be tapped in to compensate uh, if inflation goes crazy. But, you know, if we're looking at a three, let's say a, an average 3% annual inflation, again, taking out the anomalies the last several years, um, you know, if, if we gear that, if somebody needs $10,000 a month to, to retire comfortably, you know, in 20 years from now, that $10,000 isn't going to work. You're going to come up short. So, whatever that number may be exponentially, let's say it becomes 14.5. I don't have, I'm just giving you a broad uh, number. Well, then how do we get to that 14.5 and how does that negatively affect your, your money? Because at, at 85, you don't want to be sitting there saying, I could be running out of money. So manage their expectations now and in the future. Put things in perspective. Do you get people calling you with nervous calls sometimes like, oh my gosh, what is happening? Or are they just, you're always- No, because oh. we have had these conversations up front, uh, managing their risk. Uh, I tell them what I am doing for them, uh, what their expectations for me are. Uh, that's why I said I reach out to them when things go sideways just to keep make sure they're okay. But no, they don't go, uh, uh, they're- I don't want to say they're happy when the market goes down, but they understand we, you know, we, we game played that. This is what happens when your, your account, 
if the market goes X, this is how it could affect your portfolio. Are you comfortable with that? No. Well, then maybe we need to realign your investment strategy. So we do all that. So when things do go, it's within their parameters and they're not, you know, they're not saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe I lost 30% of my money. Well, you didn't. Right. You know, when they see something on TV or the market's down 100, you know, uh, 300 points. Well, you're not buying those specific stocks. Mm -hmm. You know, your your accounts are spread out and we put some guarantees where necessary, meaning there could be income, there could be principal, certain types of guarantees out there, depending on what, what they're looking for. Uh, you know, nothing's 100% guaranteed. So there, you know, there are people that are looking saying, I want to have a, you know, a steady income when I retire. Okay, well, this will give you X, uh, but... But, but. Right. Do, do you lean towards um, being like on the riskier side or less risk or in the middle with your clients or does it depend on that? Most of my clients are probably mid, um, middle of the road risk. Um, you know, if you could do the old scale one to 10, one putting it in the mattress, 10 putting it on red on the roulette wheel, they're around four and five. You know, okay. middle of the road. They don't sit there. We, we don't chase returns. All right. We build strategies for the client and what the client needs. It's just like this. Uh, you can't eat a box of donuts and then bitch because the, you got on the scale and you went up a couple pounds. So we try to manage their expectations saying, don't turn around and run out and chase yields or returns because it does have a habit of coming back and not being favorable at certain times. Again, the higher returns, the, the greater loss potential, possibly. So we try to stay in that middle of the road, four and five. That's what they want. Again, listening to them. Sure. And I'm sure some want to push it more, but it just depends on yeah. the results that they'll get in any given time for you. Yes. So talk about entrepreneurship. Do you think that it's for the faint of heart? I think there are. Entrepreneurship is romantic, okay? However, when you pull back the curtain, you know, you don't want to know how the sausage is made. I'll put it that way. And and I think that, uh, as you know, there's a lot of people that go out in the business and within two years, they're out of business because uh, what do they try to do? They try to sell their friends and family and that's great the first year. And then the second year, they look around, now, who am I going to talk to? They don't realize that uh, this is a, you have to, it's a contact sport, sales, marketing, entrepreneurship, whatever you want to call it. And if you're not out, you know, meeting people, talking to people, listening to people, um, you like to say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have a two week paid vacation. Oh, I got paid holidays. Oh, I, I went out to, uh, took a client out to, to lunch and I, my company will give me back the money I paid out. Uh, probably entrepreneurship, in my opinion, isn't for you That's because you're, you, you know, here's what I do when I take somebody out to dinner or whatever it may be. Yeah, I submit the, I submit for reimbursement, which basically says it's me. <laughs> you know, it's okay. no company. There's nobody. So entrepreneurship, you're, it's, it's all on your back, and like you said, uh, uh, live without the net. So if you, if you're looking for that. Oh, I want that steady paycheck. I know every on the 15th and the 30th, I always get paid. That may become a, a drag for you. You know, the so I think people, you know, they all say, oh, the boss is a pain in the neck. This company's a pain in the neck. I can do better on my own, everything like that. No perfect world. But like I said earlier, you're, it gets romanticized. But the reality is uh, this is tough. You got a lot of bumps and bruises. You know that. Oh yeah. A lot of scrapes. You got a lot of this. You're you're always, always uh, working, and right. always. Yeah, there's. It's not a nine to fiver. Um, so if a person likes that forty hour work week, uh, you know, there's all, there's you know the the risk reward factor. That's what it boils down to. And I think most people don't. They look at the rewards, but they don't want to take on the risk. And so that's why I don't, uh, in my opinion, 
even in my business, I see there's a high failure rate because it takes a lot. It takes a lot of hard work. And um, so the go for it if they want to. Yeah, it's hard, but it's, I think it's great. It's just, like you said, it's not for everyone. It's a roller coaster, ups and downs. I'm still learning things. I'm still making mistakes, failing forward. We will time. always make mistakes. That's life. That's how you learn. That's experience. I mean, if you stop learning, you might as well lay down and have them throw the dirt on you. So that's the way I always look at it. I'm, I'm, I learn something new every day. And that keeps my brain active. And and if I can always keep improving myself, like you said, moving forward, uh, it's all that matters. I agree. Well, that's very inspirational. How do people find you? How can they reach out on your social media or on your website? Or I don't know if you um, even have your own type of seminars. Can people uh, events you have? Seminars right now, no, I'm putting uh, stuff together probably to roll out the beginning of the year. Um, Great. But right now, uh, yeah, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Facebook, and my webpage. So DiGirolamo Financial Strategies, uh, that's probably the better way of, of uh, finding me or something like that. Uh, you know, LinkedIn is a wonderful tool. You, you you put in there, you can find me under there and and, and all the connections thereafter. So uh, if let me put it this way, you, you, today, you know how the rules are. You Google somebody. So you can always find me. I'm yeah. out there. And your name is spelled D-I-G-E-R-O-L-A-M-O, just so people know. It's D-E. D-E. G-E. G-E. R O L A M O. Perfect. Yeah. D E G E R O L A M O. Yeah. You know, us Italians have to have a lot of vowels in the name. I know. It's so true. <laughs> well, great. So hopefully people are listening. They can reach out to you for any type of financial retirement advice that they may have and um, live without a net, everyone. They can have a conversation at no cost and no obligation. Yes, that's the best. That's how that's you can the best. know if you want to work with someone. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Tony. I appreciate you for being on the show. And I'll see you at a Jersey Man event soon. I think there's one next week. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you. Of course. Thank you so much. Take care. Well, that's it for now. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And please reach out to me so I can feature you on my show. I do respond to everyone. You can find me on my Instagram at Jennifer Sherlock or my business Instagram at Jenna.com. And check out our new website coming soon, livewithoutanet.com. Thanks again, and I look forward to taking risks with you.